Ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I start by acknowledging the Ghana people. And I'd like to go a little further than the Premier last night. Um, I certainly agree with him that they were the um, spiritual custodians of the country, but I'd go a bit further and say I acknowledge them as the people who owned the country. Uh, at the very least, they had a... At the very least, they had a common law possessory title, as uh, Noel Pearson explains, and uh, it's a shame that we jib at that a bit, but the truth is that it was their country, and by the most wonderful sleight of hand, we raised a flag and said it was ours. Uh, I thank them for their tolerance and for their continuing involvement in this community. Um, yeah, last night was a really terrific start to the festival because... Um, I sat around and listened to four really intelligent people talking to another very intelligent person, Philip Adams, and they were talking about big ideas. Um, let me start by saying I've never had a big idea in my life, um, but I do love people who do have big ideas, and I have a different sort of specialty. But everything I want to say to you today is certainly based on a couple of big ideas. And the first big idea is the big idea of democracy. If there's something we should be really proud of as, a, as Australians, it is that we have this very long-lived democracy, a really successful democracy. And I want to stress that, because I'm going to be a bit critical in the course of my comments, but this is one of the longest-lived democracies in the world. There are only one or two or three. Jeff Gallup will be able to tell you later how many that are older than we are, but not many. And it really struck me as a wonderful thing when, as a relatively young person, after 23 years of uh, liberal rule during the Menzies era and post the Menzies era, they suddenly lost an election to Gough Whitlam. And the Prime Minister got into his car and went to Government House and resigned his commission. And Gough Whitlam took power. Whitlam, in due course, was defeated in an election and also handed in his commission as did um, Malcolm Fraser, Bob Hawke, Paul Keating, and John Howard. And we should just stop and really enjoy that thought, that we have a country where if you get sick of the government, you can vote them out. And that is a privilege that most of the world would love to have. So let's start with the proposition that there's a big idea, democracy. And everything I say takes place within the framework of that, and I want to say one more thing about democracy and quote the Secretary of the Treasury, Ken Henry, who said that in a democracy, people have a right to a say in the decisions that affect their lives. And that'll sort of bring us onto the remote Australia story in a, in a little time. So that's the first big idea that I pay homage to. The second big idea I really pay homage to is what you might call the brotherhood of man. I was told last night that this is the Athens of the South. Here in South Australia, this is where all the great ideas have come, or from where they've come. Look, I'm a West Australian, so I'm prepared to believe anything. <laughs> and um, I do want to say that I acknowledge the leading role that South Australia has played in some of the political advances in Australia, and the votes for women, all that sort of thing. That, that's something of which you're entitled to be proud. But I'll go back even beyond South Australia and say that I'm pretty happy to turn to the book of Genesis and remind myself that in that book we're told that each man is in the image of God. And I like to think of the French Revolution with liberty, fraternity and equality. And I often like to reread the American Declaration of Independence, which talks about certain things being self-evident. It's self-evident that each of us is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's a sort of bundle of ideas which really mean a lot to me. And again, they are the big ideas which guide what I want to say to you today about some elements of the government of Australia. Another thing that was really consoling for me last night was you had these really super bright people and a couple of them actually made the suggestion that maybe the big idea is not the hard part. Big ideas are really important, 
But perhaps it's even more difficult than having a big idea is actually putting the big idea into operation. And I guess that's where I place myself. And I place myself in the honourable role for much of my working life of a, as a politician who had to turn wonderful ideas into some sort of operating reality for the people of Australia. And that's actually quite hard work. Bruce Petty suggested that perhaps most of the big ideas have already been thought of. And the real difficulty is how to make them work. And the final preliminary comment that I'd make is this. Uh, when I left politics in 1993, I was not at all sure what to do with my life. And so I talked to a few people that I really respected, and I talked to one of the South Australians I really respect, Hugh Stratton. And I was thinking of going to university, so I said to him, is there any place for university in a university for someone like me who's really not very academically well-trained? I have a rather modest undergraduate degree. He said, it is so important, and I only paraphrase because the conversation was a long time ago, but he said, it is so important to have people who continue to observe what is actually happening. And that reminded me of what Lang Hancock said to me when I went to work for him as his in-house lawyer, the prospector, the very wealthy and successful prospector in Western Australia back in the 60s. He said this to me, Fred, I will never let you go to court and talk for me and talk about something you have not seen. So I want to say to you that any view I give you today is based on what I have seen, touched, smelt and experienced. And the criticisms I make are based on first-hand knowledge or the first-hand knowledge of people in the field who see the inanity and incompetence of government in its dealings with them. So I speak to you as a citizen an ex-political party member, as an ex-office bearer in Parliament, as a senator, a minister, a leader of my party in a party, and as a person who's never had an original thought, but a lifetime of trying to change things. And these are ideas I want to leave with you, by the way. What do we do about these great issues that are offending us? And I'll get to the things that are offending me at the moment. So I want to quote Hal Wooten one of the greatest Australians I know, ex-judge, ex-lawyer, founder, founder of a law school, founder of a legal service for Aboriginal people in New South Wales, brilliant man. At 87, he's in Ramallah University looking at the civil rights of Palestinians. At 87, he's up on the Burrup Peninsula dealing with Aboriginal differences as a mediator. And in a lecture in his own name and honour, he said this, as a young lawyer, I'm now using Hal's words, as a young lawyer I knew I would borrow from other people, borrow ideas from other people. One of the people I borrowed from was Lord Diplock. Lord Diplock, who was a great English lawyer, I interpolate, said, there are few of us who can say, as Lord Mansfield said, the air of England is too free for a slave to breathe. Let the black go free. Now there's a big idea, isn't it? <laughs> what a fantastic thing in your life as a judge to be able to say that. But Diplock went on to say, the most that the majority of us can do is to give things a little nudge, give the law a little nudge in the direction we think it should go. And when I heard that, I thought, thank God, because that explains all of our lives as active citizens. All we can do is to give things a little nudge in the direction that we think they should go. And what I hope will come from this lecture is some will on the part of some of you to give things a little nudge in the directions that I'm talking about. There are two brief tales I want to talk to you about. The first goes under the heading of something we call remote focus. Uh, I chair a statutory corporation in the Northern Territory called Desert Knowledge Australia. 
we're involved in a lot of things. We're not the Cooperative Research Centre with the same name. We're a statutory corporation and we're into basically trying to improve circumstances in the desert on the principles of harmony, sustainability and wealth creation. So we have a program for encouraging more economic activity. We're involved in leadership, we're involved in education, we're, we have a campus where there's an education institution being developed. It's a sort of generalist organisation. But one of the things we realised is that it's very hard to get things improved out there in outback Australia because the government is so awful. I don't mean that the politicians are awful people or the bureaucrats are awful people. I mean that the system just doesn't work. So everything you try and do is made more difficult by the inability of government to govern well, to govern itself and its operations. And so last year we got together just under 30 people, which included some very experienced people, like one of the speakers in the next session, uh, Professor Peter Shergold, who was the head of the Prime Minister's Department. We had the head of Treasury in Western Australia, Tim Mani. We had the head of the Chief Minister's Department in the Northern Territory. We had people like Neil Westbury, very experienced about working in the desert, particularly on Aboriginal issues. We had a few politicians, we had academics, we had people of varying experience, including the ex-governor of Western Australia, Lieutenant General Sanderson, who has great experience both internationally and within this country. And we came to some pretty devastating conclusions over the course of several days of intense conversation. I don't have time to present to you in its full what we produced at that time, which we called a prospectus revitalising remote Australia. But let me just read from the first paragraph. Governments, corporations and the Australian public in general fail to appreciate the impending calamity in remote Australia as a combination of forces threatened to tear at Australia's sense of itself as a nation, imperil its strategic position within the Asian and South Pacific region and erode the nation's capacity to sustain long-term growth. The components of what could be described as remote Australia's perfect storm include the difficulties faced by all levels of government in providing basic community services and infrastructure, even in areas of great and vital wealth production, the Pilbara area of Western Australia, for example, the lack of any, really, of any real local authority over decision-making and allocation of resources, the drift of the non-Indigenous population to more settled areas, the severe stress on indigenous culture and societal structures and the risk of collapsing fragile ecosystems in the context of outmoded land management regimes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that all sounds pretty harsh. But that was the considered view of people with a great depth of experience. And in fact, we went further and said that if you look at what is the internationally accepted definition of a failed state, and we've all heard of failed states, haven't we? We keep sending Australian troops to rescue them. We send Australian troops to rescue the Solomons. And I pay tribute, by the way, to the, to the, to the efforts of those Australians who I think do a magnificent job. But we tend to not look inwards and ask the question, are we too a failed state? within our own country. There are four criteria. First of all, there's the criteria of poverty. Is there widespread poverty? There are issues relating to violence and homicide. Is there widespread violence and homicide? There's the issue of the capacity of governments to provide basic needs for human development, particularly health and education, and there's the legitimacy of government in the lives of the people. Well, I'm afraid we thought that on all of those counts, you could find those circumstances in remote Australia. Now, what am I talking about? Try and put a map of Australia in your mind. I was going to put them up, but you'll be relieved to know I left my thumb drive in the hotel room and would have been distracting anyway. But put a map of Australia in your mind and think about what desert Australia is. And I think all of you could probably draw a quite accurate little map. You'd leave out the southeastern corner, 
including the southern part of South Australia, you'd leave out the southwest of Western Australia and you'd leave out the wet tropical north. The rest, about 70% of Australia, is arid and semi-arid. It contains 2 to 3% of the Australian population. Remote Australia is much more than that. That's all the wet bits up the top, apart from Darwin. And that's 85% of Australia's landmass, and it contains less than 5% of the population. Superimpose on that map, the, in your mental map, superimpose the boundaries of the states of Australia. And superimpose again the centres of political and administrative power, the state and federal capital, and the territory capital. And what you'll see immediately is that outback Australia, remote Australia, is just the backyard of each of those jurisdictions. It's fragmented in an entirely illogical way, in geographic, social and cultural terms, into backyards for Adelaide, Perth, Darwin, Brisbane, Sydney, and it gets backyard attention. And if you wonder and what a challenge whether it's a failed state, look at the parallels between our actions in the Solomons and our actions in the emergency intervention. We have to call in the army, we have to summons up police from other jurisdictions, we have to summons up experts in health. We have to suddenly impose an entirely different order of governance on the Northern Territory regions, remote regions. You wouldn't need that, would you, if government was working? You wouldn't need extraordinary measures if the ordinary instruments of government were working. And so, I guess I rest my case. What is this prospector saying? Is it saying, here's the answer? No, we're not, we're not silly enough to say, yeah, we've got all the answers. But we are saying that this is serious. And we need a national conversation and a national attention to this. And no more repetitive band-aids. We tend to see this through the prism of Aboriginal dysfunction. That enables governments to get away with being hopeless. Talk to the white people who live out there. You won't blame them for the dysfunction, will you? The white people will tell you as clearly as the black people that government doesn't work for us. You'll hear it from the mayors of the coastal cities of North Queensland as clearly as you'll hear it from you and Amu. You'll hear it from the town of Alice Springs, which is predominantly white. You'll hear it from the Pilbara. And you'll hear it from areas where you won't hear the other neon, neocon excuse that there's not a real economy. That's the problem. There's not a real economy. Nothing to do with the government. Well, hang on. What about the Pilbara? Pilbara produces a vast amount of this country's tradable wealth. It's 80% white. Funny, isn't it, that government doesn't work up there? And Jeff Gallup's on next. He was one of the people who was supposed to govern it. And I make no apology to Jeff because I think he would agree that in the Pilbara, there's a widespread sense among the people that they do not get the government they deserve and are entitled to. Whether it's in medical, health, or welfare, or any other provision of government services. Why did the National Party of Western Australia get the balance of power in the last election? They got it because they went out and said to the regions, you are not being treated fairly, and if we get the balance of power, we will keep 25% of the mining royalties in the regions. And they won support where they'd never had support before. And they got the balance of power. And they've got royalties for regions. But that's a political fix, and I congratulate the Nationals of Western Australia for doing it, because they were trying to right a wrong. 
But the fact of the matter, it's a political fix and we need an institutional fix. We need to change the way money is distributed in this country. We need to do away with a system where the Grants Commission makes grants to states and territories on the basis of their disadvantage through remoteness and Aboriginal population, and then the money is spent in the capital city. Because that's what happens. That's what happens. So you've got to do something about the money flows, you've got to do something about the decision making and the administration of policies. And I want to talk now a bit about public administration and its incapacity. I'd like to talk a lot about public service because I actually have spent most of my life in what I regard as public service and I regard it as a noble vocation. I started life as a public servant in New Guinea. I worked for the major part of my working life as a politician and I regard that as public service. I've worked as a statutory officer of the Commonwealth and I spend most of my time now trying to make government work better. Here's an example of the top level thinking on the issue of how we are going to provide services in remote Australia, in this case to Aboriginal people. This is the Commonwealth State Agreement called the National Partnership Agreement on Remote Service Delivery. And it's a fantastic document. I've only got five minutes, so I'll have to be very quick. This document contains all of the learnings that I think you can have about what you need to do to efficiently, as a government, work with Aboriginal communities effectively. And in the third schedule, there is detailed, brilliantly set out rules about how to do it. And it involves consultation involving Aboriginal people so they share the ownership of what you are doing and it will be effective. The trouble with this document is that it's internally inconsistent because it sets timetables which are not compatible with working with Aboriginal people in the way you have to work. So what I'm saying is there is a breakdown in the system because the ideas are pulled together in a way which pays no regard to making them work or very little regard to making them work. Because time is short, let me quickly refer you to a couple of things to those of you who may be interested. Here's a history of the Catherine West Health Service probably one of the best historic attempts to do things well in the field of health in the Northern Territory. A wonderful community-based health service where the Commonwealth and the Northern Territory tipped all the money into a single pot and put it in the hands of a community-controlled health service. That took years to put together. And it was only the brilliant leadership of Marion Scrimger, the Aboriginal now politician, that kept governments at bay long enough for the people to be engaged. I'd invite you to read a book called Bureaucrats and Bleeding Hearts by Northern Territory academic Tess Lee, which is an anthropological study, not of Aboriginal people, but of Territory health workers. How do people behave when they're doing work which produces no results? Well, I tell you what, they have lots of meetings and lots of whiteboards and lots of strategizing and lots of resignations. And finally, let me throw doubts on our whole capacity to govern to the advantage of disadvantaged people by referring to a pommy lord, Andrew Mawson, who within five miles of Westminster transformed parts of the east end of London into a thriving, entrepreneurial, better place. His book is called The Social Entrepreneur. And it's a sorry tale for those of us who spent our lives in politics and public administration because he found politicians, including Tony Blair in his third way, pretty useless. Not pretty useless, useless. He suggests that it is only by empowering individuals who have the capacity to do things that you will remove a disadvantage. I think we need to seriously talk about and think about the way we structure our government and our public administration. This is the best period of my life, think of it in Aboriginal affairs terms, in terms of community commitment, corporate commitment, government commitment in terms of good intentions, government commitment of new money to deal with these problems. Everything's hunky-dory except the capacity to deliver. 
I don't want to hear any more high policy. I don't want to hear any more big ideas. I want to hear how we're going to do it.